Good morning. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, when Alan spoke, well, a year ago, um, Alan and I started talking about this, and we, and, and the initial thing was, you know, about alternative lixiviants, and I thought that, you know, actually, the aim is not always to get alternative lixiviant, but rather getting a fit-for-purpose lixiviant. And often we'll find that, in most cases, cyanide very much still suffices. But um, let's have a look and see what, what are the questions we need to ask when we look at um, the options that are available. Um, firstly, it's not the lixiviant only, it's not the ligand, but it is the whole leach system. Not only what happens in the leach, but also what's happening downstream that we have to look at. So it's all about context. The ore and the concentrate chemistry, the mineralogy, the natural, natural and geographical setting, the engineering aspects, all require an engineered approach to selecting our lixivian system. We often find that elimination of cyanide, at least from a toxicity perspective, is not really a big driver except for a very small number of jurisdictions where you actually find that the deposit is actually in the jurisdiction that you're interested in. Because in many jurisdictions, cyanide is actually quite acceptable. The other thing is, even with the most benign lixivians, we can still mobilize toxic elements like mercury and like arsenic, and the solution that you get out of it is toxic anyway. So one has to keep these things into account. Um, the process economics we find is often the biggest driver. So if it makes sense from an economical perspective in the overall life of mine, great. The major, uh, for us, the major cost in gold mining operations typically associated with the mining and the tailings, which are the major structures in a mining. The actual process plant is very small. And if you go to South Africa, for instance, the actual cost of the processing is 5% of less of the overall cost. So optimizing the 5% is not a big, big driver. But if you can do things that can integrate into what you do in the mine and how it impacts downstream closure and the tailings operations, you're really addressing one of the key, key cost areas. The other thing that we should remember, gold is typically on average about one part per million in most of the world's ores these days. Some of us are blessed with better grades, but that's very typical. But the costs, so the revenue sits in that, but the costs are based on the other 999,000 parts. Other thing, cyanide is often the most appropriate solution to this problem. Okay. One of the executive vice presidents that I spoke to once um, um, said, you know, our metallurgists know all the answers to all the wrong questions. And um, I'm trying to take a stab at what questions should we ask. Now, it's important to say that there are I think what's important, we can't fight thermodynamics and we have to stay with that space. But we, when we look at lixiviants on the next slide, we will find that there are many options. They have very good reviews. Uh, Mark Aylmore, in the, in the audience's example, has written a, a very good review um, about the lixiviants in, and, and the various things out there. My aim is not today to go through all the lixiviants in detail. My aim is to say, well, how do we position and how do we choose how we gonna, which lixivian system we're going to use? Now, thermodynamics is a guide, and we see that cyanide is right up there in terms of, of its stability. Um, firstly, for a dicyano species, we typically see that our, our, our equilibrium constant is of the order of 38. That's about 10 orders of magnitude better than thiosulfate. Thiosulfate, again, is 10 orders of magnitude better than something like glycine that we'll talk about this afternoon. We will also um, when we look at the, at, at the halide species, we find that the, the higher halide, which is normally the gold in the 3 plus form, has got the higher um, equilibrium constant. However, to get there, we need more oxidizing such, um, conditions on the one hand, and we also need naturally more of that lixivian to be present. Worthwhile to look at all these, but I'll actually get to, to these comments a bit later on in terms of you know, some of these um, um, uh, uh, ligands that we would use would be expensive, some have, are volatile, some are toxic, some are not that selective, particularly when we look at some of the situations where we run strong acid 
and we start dissolving not only the gold, but everything else as well. Some have got slight cash flow kinetics. Glycine is one of those. One of those um, then some tend to be co-precipitate some other species. Key thing, however, is that this sets the scene as to what we can do. And this actually comes, this table comes from Mark's actually paper um, in the book edited by Mike Adams on gold processing technology. The next slide as well. If we look at, and this is actually quite nice to see this on the EHPH diagram. Now, the EHPH diagram has got its limitations naturally. Firstly, it's at 25 degrees Celsius. It's under a very specific ionic uh, uh, strength situation that you've got here. Um, and um, the other part that is, is that typically, um, this is also for, so temperature-wise, concentration-wise, there are specific limits. It's also an equilibrium diagram. That said, it's still useful to see, again, this is from Mark's paper, the, the ranges, and we see a spread across, but the key thing is that there is a window. There's an operating window for each of these lixivians. If we go out of that window, we typically see that that lixivian is, is, is running into, into challenges. The other thing that this shows is actually that there might be benefit in the future in looking at synergistic mixtures of these because you can cover a bigger space by using a synergistic mixture or a hybrid of, of reagents rather than a single reagent to try and cover a larger space. Now, Cyanide is a tough competitor. It is, forms a very stable, as we've shown, gold complex with a low cost recovery option. It's a small anion with a high diffusion rate, making mass transfer very rapid. Air and oxygen, we typically use, are low cost reagents. It's mostly selective, not always, but mostly. So typically, in the presence of sulfur, copper, nickel, and iron, or reactive iron, should you say, it's not going to be iron oxide, but reactive iron, like something like pyrotite. We typically find that cyanide does react with those and form, and they become significant cyanide consumers. The nice thing of cyanide is that it actually can easily be destroyed, which is different to something like bromine or mercury, what they use in the start. So knowing that something can be destroyed is useful from a, from a closure perspective. It's got high reaction kinetics at room temperatures and at low temperatures. The human fatality is directly relatable to cyanide is really insignificant in the chemical industry. Yes, we've seen fish and bird deaths sometimes associated, but in terms of human fatalities, close to, you know, it, it is, it's truly insignificant if you compare to the general chemical industry. And the chemistry is reasonably well understood, and the process is really reasonably widely accepted. I should say there's a bit of a caveat there. Uh, when we go out to our operations globally, we actually see that our metallurgists globally understand the chemistry far poorer than we normally think for something as standard as cyanide that has been with us for nearly 150 years. So when do we consider alternatives? When it's not allowed in the jurisdiction, oh, that's obvious. But there are a few others that need to be looked at. The one is for in situ or in mine leaching. In situ is literally when you've got an injection and extraction well, but in mine leaching is when you do like an underground heap or when you irrigate a, a, a drop cave. That's typically when you look at in mine type of leaching. When the ore contains highly active preg robbing carbon, and one of the reasons why you, for instance, run with thiosulfate is, is uh, that example where thiosulfate adsorbs poorly on activated carbon, which is one of the reasons why you actually want to use thiosulfate. When there are um, significant cyanocytes present, we've identified them earlier on, when the detoxification costs or the recovery costs actually becomes quite large. When the dry tailings disposal implies barren leachate recycling. So suddenly when you start, when you look, for instance, you're working in the Atacama Desert or in the Americas in general, there's a big drive towards dry tailings disposal. And as you do that, the one part is now the liquor that you want to recycle. Now that liquor will accumulate certain salts and certain species, and suddenly you start accumulating thiocyanate and cyanide and ferrocyanide and so on, and other species. And also, when it's difficult to economically operate, the pH is greater than 9. So these are all places where it would be considered. It's not where you will definitely do it, but at least when you would consider it. So 
what are the purposes that our lexivian system has to fit? And then we say, well, we, it has to fit a context. It has to fit the context of ge geology and mineralogy, the context of uh, the natural and geographic setting, the context of its engineering economics, the materials, reagents, and products. So we go to the few slides, and a lot, I know it's a lot of text, but I think it, it try and capture all these questions that we have to address. So we have to design our system for that 999,000 parts, and 999. The um, following aspects is key. Grade is probably one of the biggest issues. If you've got a high-grade system, like often like electronic waste or concentrates, you can use very, your, your number of options are actually quite wide in terms of the lexivians you can use. Lexivian cost becomes less of an issue. As you go towards lower grade, it changes both the type of leach motor that you're going to use and the lexivian you're going to fit to that. The other thing is acid consumers. For, for our acidic lexivians, like acidic thiocyanate, acidic chloride, thiourea, when they are acid consuming minerals that it interacts with, your cost of your lexivian can quickly go through the roof. On the other hand, you might also have alkali consumers. You might have active silicates or reactive sulfides. I remember one day when we did a survey for Cortez mine and um, we just looked at, the, at the, uh, the lime consumption and we realized why on earth is the lime consumption so high? Because it's essentially just a high silicate system. But the fact that it is, was a chalcedony quartz rather than, which is a, basically a, 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 the different type of structure than your typical igneous quartzes, it becomes a reactive material that actually consumes alkali. Your cyanide consumer, um, you have to design for your cyanide consuming minerals. The carbon in the preg robbers is important. Now, it's not only, car it's, the carbon is not the only preg robber. There are certain preg robbers that if you work with an acidic chloride system, minerals like a pyrophyllite and so on, which is a silicate, becomes a preg robber depending on the grind size. Your reductants and oxygen demanding minerals, such as some of the reactive sulfides, will also have an impact on our lexivian system. And bacteria degradation. Now the important part here is not the bacteria you use in a bioleach. I'm talking about the bacteria that actually impacts your lexivian system. So this is basically the bacteria that breaks down your lexivians or can either oxidize or reduce or degrade your lexivians over time. And we have to say, well, have you evaluated that? And, and you're operating pH. Very often, if we're operating around neutral pH, for instance, and very moderate EH conditions, bacteria can thrive. And you can have bacteria all over your circuit. Groundwater is an important part, particularly if it's hypersaline or high magnesium. It impacts in the end also, again, maybe your choice of lexivian that is, that, is, that is appropriate. Your clays is important. For instance, if we look at the elite, montmorillonite, nontronite, kaolin, the various clays that you typically find, has an impact not only on cyanide, well, it's actually also on cyanide, particularly if you've got silver, for instance, space, uh, uh, fine, you find that, for instance, the elite clay would absorb a lot of silver cyanide species in a heap leach, for instance. So if you've got a heap leach time frame and you've got a lot of these clays, you will find a lot of preg robbing onto that clay. Not preg borrowing, but actually robbing, particularly in the heap leach environment. Mercury, both in the ore in terms of its various minerals, but also the way that your reagent will later on mo mobilize this is of, of importance. So some would mobilize it far more than others. Silver. Unless you've got silver that's typically more than 10 to 1 ratio, considering that silver's price is 1 80th of the gold price, you're going to use far more cyanide. It becomes, a co it becomes an expense to actually try and dissolve silver unless you've got a sufficient amount of it to make it worthwhile. We see more and more that high sulfur ores where there's reactive sulfides in the form of marcosite, pyrite, pyrotite, arsenopyrite, and particularly when they are ground down, when they're ultrafine ground, they tend to become activated and they form thiocyanate. So again, does that sulfur react with your lexivians? Does it, and, and there are a number of lexivians that actually sulfur do react with.
when we look at the natural settings, the, our natural settings have got a range of, of, of impacts as well. One would not normally think, we, when we develop lixiviants in the laboratory, it's one thing, but then you say, well, actually, you know, there are things that are totally, say, non-chemical related that is going to determine our choice. We know that certain areas won't allow roasting. Some other areas won't allow cyanide use. Some areas will have a big problem with thiourea as a, as a potential carcinogen. Rainfall and snow melts is a big issue. Again, particularly if you've got open structures like heap leaches, which influences your water balance and your leach. Your tailings impoundments, again, um, uh, one, of, one of the mines in South America and, um, two years ago was significantly impacted by snow melt coming through the heap up in the Andes. Elevation above sea level is important because when you're getting to you know, the levels of, of Yanacocha, for instance, in Peru, and you're you know, 4,000 meters above sea level, your partial pressure of oxygen is quite, quite far lower than you've got at sea level. And so how we think about oxygen and oxidants in this lixivian system is different. And the, uh, the options that we've got around our, our, our process design needs to be adapted to these um, low um, oxygen partial pressures. Temperatures, well, there's a hell of a big difference to what, if you look at the north of Australia, where we sometimes see temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius, and Canada, and you get temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius. And again, what you can do, for instance, again with heat leaches. So in Canada, most of the milling operations are or under roof structures, they're, they're, within, they're within buildings. But as soon as you go to a heap leach, that naturally limits as to what you can do outside. The prevailing wind is important, particularly with regards to roaster gases, but also the things that are in the lixivian circuit. Are, if we're going to use ammonia, ammonia is volatile. Some systems use hydrosulfide systems. Hydrogen sulfide is an issue. Sulfur dioxide is an issue. So, that needs to be considered. We recently dealt with a, with a company where, um, with placing a plant in Indonesia. Eventually, we looked at that and then we actually see that probably an in situ or in mine application is probably best because they're in an area where there are earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes. So, in the end, trying to do a heap leach or a valley fall is actually quite, a <laughs> quite brave if you want to do that. But also, it was in that particular case, it was linked to the amount of land available. So they can't, there was also not a lot of land available even to, do, to put on a tailings dam. Water availability is an issue in many areas. And if you go to the Atacama Desert, for instance, you don't have a choice because the water is so valuable that often it's at higher than $5 per cube. And in the end, because of the, the value of the water, you want to recycle the water. So you're going to go for dry tailings anyway, dry stacking. Not because any environmental driver, but purely because of the cost of the water. And that automatically influences what you can do with your luxivient, because now you're actually recovering your luxivient. Politics and sovereign risk is important. Um, we see, for instance, in Indonesia that you are forced to do to go to a certain point with, and you have to do certain operations within country. Um, then engineering economics. We find typically that, you know, as there are certain limitations when we look at the, uh, tailings, dam impoundments and river ocean disposals, that again will impact again your lixivian choice. Because are you going to have cyanide-laced tailings that you're going to have to dispose of or whatever other system? And for instance, you don't want to lose an iodine-based lixiviant to tailings. It's just too expensive. Geotechnics will influence our choice for in-situ, in-mine, heap and dump leaching. The nature of the ore deposit and the mining methods we typically find that there might be a significant spatial variation in the mineralogy in the mine, both at, in the horizontal space as well as in the vertical. And as we transition from the oxide to the supergene to the hypergene or the primary ore, we get significant variation. And the question is, to what extent is your plant developed 
for that ore body and how robust is your lixivian system to handle that variation as you go from oxide to supergene to hypergene. Financing. Often, this is a totally non-technical factor, but it's, it might have a huge impact because often you want to, the finance it pushes you into the direction that we don't have a lot of finance, we'll consider a heap leach if the topography of the land actually allows it, for instance. But on financing, you know, um, so, so you start to build up some cash with one technique, but again, it, it has got an impact on our choice of lixiviant, particularly if that heap that we want to leach, for instance, is a polymetallic heap with gold and copper. And suddenly you don't want to run with huge amounts of cyanide circulating through an open system. There's a bit of duplication here, but it's, it's, I think it's important here that we, with filtered tailings, this now provides us with an opportunity to recover those, um, those reagents. But we have to understand that whether we're running with cyanide systems or let's say a thiosulfate system, we've got polythionates in the system or degradation products, let's say from a thiourea system, all of these have got an impact and we ha our water system design has to cater for that. However, in the first place, at least these recovery systems for water implies that we can actually consider more exotic lixivian systems. Um, your detox requirements may be reduced or even eliminated using hybrid or synergistic systems. One of the things that we're doing, for instance, in the glycine space is we're running a hybrid of a small amount of cyanide with glycine. Reason why you do that is you can actually minimize or eliminate your detox component, get down below 50 ppm of wad, have no free cyanide, and your, that cost essentially, which can be quite significant, is dealt with in that way. The other thing is our mineralogical changes in the process in the process itself or process intermediates. We might be forming calcines through a roaster. Well, and you compare that, for instance, to when you do an acidic pox and that residue coming from that, which actually is acidic residue and again needs neutralization before you go for an alkaline type of lixivian system. Or you can apply an acidic system that matches the upfront acidic system. So if you've got an acidic pox or acidic biox, Without neutralization, you can consider going towards an acidic downstream system. Particularly if that was applied on a concentrate, you can start using a more exotic lixivian system downstream. Key thing with, often these days we, we've got float circuits because we have to reject a lot of gang and upgrade the, the gold. And typically then that sulfide concentrate, we often ultra fine grind to, to liberate or at least expose the gold. However, in that ultrafine grinding, what happens is that often we start activating the pyrite. And that pyrite, which was fairly inactive when the particle was a 75 micron particle, becomes highly active when it's sub 10 micron particle. And it basically starts consuming, again, a lot of your lixivians. Corrosion is a thing that we also have to look at from an engineering perspective. If we want to run with an acidic system, again, an acidic chloride system, an acidic thiourea system, an acidic thiocyanate system, corrosion becomes a far more challenging issue than in the alkaline space. And we have to look at the materials and construction. They can become expensive. So our halide and our nitrate leaching systems, um, they can all um, cause problems. The other thing is also what we're going to treat. Our decision to treat, we develop lixivian systems often for a very particular material type, whether it's ores or tailings or anode slimes coming out of a, of a copper smelter or waste rocks or urban mining, electronic scrap, for instance. Our approaches and the lixivian system that we will choose will be quite, will depend on that, those systems. Energy. A lot of the places for gold mining are very remote. They're high up in the mountains somewhere in the Andes. They're in the middle of the desert. They're far from any main power source. So you don't have a lot of 
poles and wire bringing electricity to the site. It's expensive to do that. So now, again, your electricity might actually drive your leach method. And your leach method, again, it drives often your lixiviant that, goes, that matches it. Again, for heap leach and in-situ leaching, you can consider running photovoltaics. And the photovoltaics will then serve, particularly for, for those areas served by, by poor, uh, that are poorly served with power networks, to arouse something like an irrigate and soak cycle. You basically pump during the day and soak during the night. And this is a very good practice, actually, for a lot of heaps. The labor turnover is another issue that we have to deal with. And it influences, again, our lixivians. Why? Because often if you've got a complex chemistry with a high process sensitivity, your operating window is small, and you have to keep it absolutely on that knife edge, and you have to run it like a chemical factory, not a conventional mining operation, you need highly trained operators, and you need them to stay at site and not have a turnover with you know, a typical metallurgist staying two years at site and then disappearing. So even that, even our labor component influenced the way we think about the civilians. Safety, health, and environment. Yes, we've got the toxicity, which was the obvious one, but there are other things like odor. Ammonia is a big issue, for instance. Process safety, impacts on bird and marine life, health impacts due to long-term exposure that needs to be evaluated. Logistics, distance from the road, the port, the rail infrastructure, the social unrest, criminality, all of them impacting the agent and product transport. You will find, for instance, in Africa, that often you'll have, or in South America, significant road accidents, transport dangerous goods, hijacks. In southern Africa, often it has happened that a track of cyanide has been hijacked. That material was basically, people are then using the cyanide to put into wells and, and poison animals so that for poachers. So the poachers go and they actually poison wells in southern Africa, get the die off of the animals. That's incredible, but it happens. Or where a truck leaves the road and actually went down the Orange River in South Africa where of, of sulfuric acid. Same can happen with cyanide. So again, we have to be aware about the reagents that we transport to site. One of the key problems that we see in industry is the metallurgical understanding of upper management. Often the understanding is very poor about anything in the chemistry space. And there's a lot of anxiety. So no matter how good your lixivian system is, the fact that it's different to cyanide is for them a huge problem, just because it's different. They don't necessarily have the risk appetite, and they want cut and paste solutions. Oh, we've done that there. However, ironically, the risk is far higher because you have to design your lixivian system to the environment it operates in. But they want that cut and paste because they just don't understand. The other part that we have to deal with is the ease of site remediation, closure, and legacy. We have to deal with the residual reagents that are in tailings and the products and mobilized deleterious elements. And we have to design for that and understand to what extent our lixivian actually mobilize these or destabilize this in the ore. On the reagents and products, we, when we're dealing with things like weaker complexes, we need higher reagent concentrations. When we're looking at reagent metal chemical thermodynamics, we have to understand what's our best EH pH concentration stability area. We have to look at kinetics. We know, for instance, that let's say the glycine option that we talk about this afternoon is not really, unless there's cyanide present, a bit of cyanide, but not a lot, but unless there's a bit of cyanide present, it's not really well designed for a tank leach system. There are things that we've done to actually improve that, but the base system is not, is not really well, well applicable for that. The cost of provision of oxidation can be quite significant, again, for the lixivian system, not only the ligand. Will air suffice, or do we actually need things like hydrogen peroxide, or potassium permanganate, or ferric oxalate, or cupric to be an oxidant? So, for instance, we use cupric as an oxidant in thiosulfate systems. We also use an oxidant in, in glycine systems. We use ferric oxalate also, often in, 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 in thiosulfate systems others in permanganate, but each of those has got its own set of dangers, its own set of impacts on the system. The stability is an important part of our, um, of our products, to oxidation, reduction, temperature, pH change, biological degradation. 
cover that one. Um, reagent cost and bulk availability is quite important. When Barrick actually went and they built their, their, their um, thiosulfate uh, plant in, in Goldstrike, there wasn't the thiosulfate salt available, and they actually had to have their own thiosulfate facility, manufacturing facility on site. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's basically starting off with, it with like a lime sulfur system and then moving towards calcium thiosulfate. Um, so the other thing is some reagents are produced only by a small number of suppliers. For instance, bromine. Bro you don't have that many producers of bromine or the various stabilized forms like geobrom and stabrom and so on, which are produced by, by albumol. You've got single producers and you're beholden to that single producer that has got you Literally, you're beholden to them, which is, a, which is a dangerous commercial situation to be in. Environmental permitting of new reagents, even if it's a benign reagent, because the permitting bodies don't necessarily understand it, means it's going to take a while to get your permitting organized for a site, even if it's glassy, and you can eat it. That's not good enough. They still need to understand what, needs, what, is, what is happening. Reagent and product uh, transport restrictions need to be considered. We see, saw that overland transport is particularly risky. The volatility, ironically, most of our reagents are quite volatile. Ammonia is volatile, H2S is volatile, hydrogen cyanide is volatile, HCl, NOx from, hydrant, from nitric acid, iodine, chlorine, bromine are all volatile. Solubility is an issue. For instance, so there should be another bracket there. Um, the silver, you, you might actually run a system where you form halides, silver halides. And unless your concentration of your chloride or bromide is high enough, these form deposits on the surfaces and passivate our minerals. We might have significant reagent or product disproportionation degradation. Thiourea is an example. Thiourea would break down to formidine, formidine um, um, disulfide, cyanamide, sulfur, and possibly H2S, which is why we often require a lot of thiourea in thiourea-based leach systems. The other part which is important is can we, once we've leached it, selectively recover it through adsorption, solvent extraction, ion exchange, precipitation, and cementation. And our lixivian system, we need to look at all of those in terms of our design and build up a corpus of knowledge around those others for that lixivian system. And the question is, can you select selectively recover the metal complex of interest without excessive recovery of the other lixiviated metals? So you're getting, for instance, copper glycinate and gold glycinate, can you actually separate the two? Does the metal complex transfer through the new phase, for instance, during adsorption of solvent extraction or only the metal cation? What I mean by this is, is it, if you've got a, a, a copper gold cyanide system, for instance, and you've got an SX circuit as an example, not the normal way, but let's say for example, does the whole complex transfer into the organic or is it only the cation? Then on the selectivity of leach, what we find is with acidic leaches tend to be far less selective. When you start running in the acid space, you start dissolving a lot of the gang minerals. And a lot of your acid is actually consumed, not necessarily the ligand, so not necessarily your thiourea, for instance, or your thiocyanate, but your sulfuric acid, which is part of that lixivian system, and which is part of the cost of that system, is consumed because of those gang components. So if you've got calcite or acid-consuming silicates, they all create a problem in terms of gang coated solution with these acidic lixivian systems. When we look at thermal energy requirements, you have to ask yourself, does your lixivian system require heating? So a lot of the systems are actually designed to operate at around 50 or 60 degrees Celsius rather than 25 or 10 degrees Celsius. But converse is also true. Sometimes our leach environment itself is naturally hot. It comes out of a pox autoclave, for instance, and it's hot. Or 
the, you, you're basically doing in situ leaching or underground leaching, and the rock temperature is at 60 degrees. So it's naturally hot. And you can actually utilize that. And firstly, matching your lixivian system with the available energy that's available and the temperature actually becomes a very important interaction. The molecule size is important. You get, for instance, um, in the US, they've developed a, a co lixivian system, um, alpha cyclodextrin, which works with uh, gold bromide, as an example. But it's a, it's a big molecule. Alpha cyclodextrin is not a small molecule. It diffuses slowly. Glycine is three times the size on, on a molecular weight basis, basis compared to cyanide. So it diffuses more slower, or slower. And when does it start to matter? Well, on, in systems which are strongly diffusion dependent. So if you've got, a, a, for instance, as the particle size grows and you've got micro cracks going into particles, you're more dependent upon diffusive flow rather than convective flow. In a stirred tank, it's convective flow. It's easy to bring the reagent to the point of reaction. But if we go look at diffusive flow, it actually takes longer. And the size of the molecule and the diff diffusion constants actually do matter a lot. We can easily destruct things like cyanide. We can actually destroy things like glycine if it's in an acidic space. But it's more difficult to do so with things like thiocyanate and impossible for things like bromine. So when you do closure of the site, and you've got a lot of that stuff hanging around, it might become a problem. Some of these excipients are going to mobilize arsenic and mercury. Some will dissolve, some will not dissolve, and some will dissolve and reprecipitate. And do you have a handle and understanding of that for your lixivian system? Do you have a true understanding of your electrochemistry, the passivation and semiconductor behavior? For instance, you might have a system of, of pyrite, chocolate pyrite. Gold is at, at, you know, locked into that system. And things like chocolate pyrite behaves as a semiconductor. And you need reagents that actually matches the, the transition in that, in that valence band of the semiconductor behavior. And that might often be the biggest effect in your rate determining step during leaching. I've mentioned the diffusion issue, but this is maybe just from another angle, and that's the particle size. Okay, so all that said, you might have seen that there's a lot of, you know, often I find a few interesting product mixtures coming out of countries. I don't want to name them at the moment. But coming here and saying, we've got this fairy dust that can basically dissolve and do it. It's non-cyanide. Actually, when you didn't go and test it, it's got some cyanide in it. But beyond that, they don't want to tell you what's in it. So for us, as scientists and engineers, we need to understand our system. So be careful of the magical and the secret additives. Understand the chemistry. Understand the impacts of each reagent in the process during the leaching downstream, up, up, up to tailings, and also the recycle streams. Make sure that there is a sizable corpus of knowledge and to basically back up the claims and all the sales talk. This is why we believe that the best way to get acceptance of your system is to publish as much as possible, not as little as possible. Secret ingredients in pre-mixed lixivian systems can have unwanted and unpredictable impacts on corrosion, and materials construction, the environment, safety, process operability, particularly when these are allowed to accumulate and basically mobilize deleterious elements in ways that we don't understand. There may be unknown interactions with other minerals, process water and reagents, which can occur, and it's very difficult to perform an acceptable process hazard and risk analysis if you've got some of these magical reagents or secret reagents that nobody wants to tell you about. So there is no holy grail. There is no panacea. We have to do our homework. We have to apply the same rigor to our metallurgical evaluation of lixivian systems as geologists apply to their ore body and mining engineers to design. Too often we find the metallurgy is an afterthought. Cut and paste approaches are not wise, particularly as the more complex ores and lower grades require bespoke studies and bespoke solutions. We have to choose our lixivian system which is fit for purpose for the context in which we need to function. 
So ask the right questions before you proceed. Understand the risks, but don't at least be feel overwhelmed by them. Understand the chemistry, not only of the leach, but the overall process. And identify how upstream mineral processing and pre-concentration might actually impact your decision of your lexivian system. These things work hand in hand. Understand that you actually can do mineral processing, and the mineral processing can actually help you in, in, in making a difference in your lexivian system. But our real challenges, and this is probably the last slide, the real questions to us is, one of the problems that we're seeing more and more is do metallurgists and chemical engineers understand sufficient chemistry and mineralogy to evaluate the process chemistry and process mineralogy? Which is ouch. It's painful to know that, but we're seeing that. For me as a professor at the university, it's difficult to ask that question because it's a reflection on our university system. As a real, are real metallurgists with in-depth metallurgy and their insight uh, beyond comminution and classification? Are they still around? Because we typically see that most metallurgists that I know get beyond the mill and the, and, and the cyclone and, you know, it becomes the dark arts of chemical metallurgy. Maybe not for you as an audience, but at operational level, it's a different story. Do the companies have the risk appetite to implement these new chemistries? We often see that it's difficult to sell it up the chain. Would they support a new process which they don't have the expertise to judge? The chemistry and the interactions, if they don't know this, how will they make a call? So given the poor understanding that we often see for conventional cyanide systems that have been known for a century, it's no surprise that the uptake for these different chemistries is very low in the industry. However, all this said, we have fantastic people, many of them in this audience and the previous audiences in this ALTA conference. And we have doubts that are out there. You need to ask, you need to investigate, you need to read. We need to give special acknowledgement to the superstars here of Gold Heart Metallurgy. People like AJ Parker, Ian Ritchie, David Muir, I do want to read them out. Stephen Lebroy, Mark Aylmore, Jim Mavramidis, John Rumble, Yanni van Deventer, Mike Nickel, Tam Tran, Jan Miller, Chris Fleming, Mike Adams, Paul Brewer, Matthew Jeffrey, Gus van Viert, John Mars and Ian House, David Reisinger, John Manhemius, Guy De Shen, Jurgen Lorosh, Dave Lunt, Joe Ferrin, Yunuk Choi, Peter Kondos, Dan Kappas, Gamini Senyaki, Brent Heskey, Bill Staunton, Bruno Serracini, Marty Kotzer. These people, if you go in the history of the past 50, 100 years or 50 years, they have been transformational in terms of our choices, not only in terms of what happens in the laboratory, but actually driving practice in industry. But these, again, built and stood on the shoulders of other giants, the ones that preceded them. MacArthur, the Forrest Brothers, Zadra, Merrill and Crow. We may have the insight and the imagination to address the challenges of the gold metallurgy in the future environment. So, so may we have, may we as the younger group of, of metallurgists these days, have these insights that they started with. Thank you very much.